East, the Middle East Center was uh, one of the, um, uh, a strong, um, um, has a strong mission of basically uh, outreaching and uh, expressing the different things that we do culturally on campus and off campus with our students and uh, faculty members and our guests from the community as well. And we definitely miss interacting with you. Uh, we would like to thank also uh, the Globe and uh, everyone who worked really hard uh, to make this a successful event. And we hope that you enjoy what we have to talk about and present. Um, I'm going to share my screen here with you so we can move ahead. So, ahlan wa sahlan, welcome, shalom, uh, and uh, let me begin uh, by introducing uh, my colleague, Dr. Zena Shlenov, uh, the director of the Middle East Center, uh, who's going to be basically talking to you a little bit about the mission and the background of our center and what we do and what we have to offer. And then after that, we will move on to the next um, uh, part of this presentation. Zena, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm so happy to see how many people are joining us. This is International Education Week and this is Education Month. And uh, we are really happy and glad that the Globe really is co-hosting this event with us. This is one of the highlights of, uh, of our activities. So I will tell you a little bit about the Middle East Center. We're here at FSU. We do offer an academic environment for students to develop a deeper understanding of the Middle East. We are very committed to tolerance, to inclusion, to civility among all our students. And this is a message that is very important to us and very important to FSU as well, FSU's mission. Uh, we're located in the Kellogg's Research Building. Of course, for now, I mean, we are not there. We're teaching just remotely, but we look forward to getting back on campus and seeing all your lovely faces again. So the next slide, please. Okay, let me tell you a little bit. We offer a major in Middle Eastern studies. Uh, we have, if people are uh, in the major, they can do honors in the major and write a thesis. We have minors in Middle East studies in Arabic and in Hebrew. Anyone that would like more information, we just put the Middle East Center's website in the chat so you can find out more information. This is from our academic uh, side. Next slide, please. And we do have a very strong outreach program. Um, we really is, our mission is to increase the knowledge about the Middle East in our students and the individuals in the greater Tallahassee area. Uh, the Middle East Center organizes a lecture series every year, and uh, we have several events that are on campus. We, uh, for 11 years, we have uh, held a Middle East Film Festival. We're working on it for the spring semester, and hopefully we will be able to offer it uh, remotely this year. We have an Arabic outreach program where we outreach to public and private schools in uh, Tallahassee, and our program goes from K through eighth grade, where our students, our Middle East Studies majors and our student volunteers go to these schools and present the Middle East and tutor students. Uh, is mostly in the after school programs, but also sometimes work with the social studies uh, teachers as well. And uh, our volunteer students can also get the surf script by, you know, by uh, volunteering with our program. Uh, we'll go to the next one. And now I will let one of our students Ethan, who is going to tell you about the Arabic Honor Society. This is very uh, exciting because it is a new society and I believe we are probably one of the first in the US to start this Arabic Honor Society. So Ethan, we'll go to you now. 
Thank you, Dr. Zaina. Um, I'm, I, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, I'm not sure if Peyton was going to cover this part, but um, seems like she's muted right now. So, um, hi, I'm Ethan. I am the historian for the Arabic Honor Society. Uh, Ms. Peyton Parkin is our president. Um, the Arabic Honor Society is a student organization that aims to recognize students who have maintained excellent academic performance studying the Arabic language, its culture, and um, the people at Florida State. And so membership is open to all students enrolled in Arabic courses here at Florida State uh, with a GPA of at least 3.0. Um, it promotes excellent scholarship and creates a safe space where students can exchange ideas thoughts and achievements regarding the Arabic language in particular and the Middle East as a whole. Um, it should be noted that active members must have taken Arabic courses for at least two semesters, and that can be the fall, spring, or summer. Um, and in order to be inducted, uh, you have to have at least a uh, second year status, so being a uh, sophomore. Um, our events coming up for this semester um, although it is short, we will have one. Um, we're hosting a general body meeting on Monday, November 16th. Um, and the time in the Zoom for that will be provided later. Um, and I will be linking down below a link uh, to submit a Google form if you're interested in joining. Um, we'll just go through, we're gonna introduce the cabinet and the e-board members and Dr. Labo Beatty, who spoke earlier, be presenting to us a lecture about his research regarding Arabic phonetics and phonology and dialectic, uh, or sorry, dialectical variations in Arabic, as well as some other fun activities. Um, and we also hope to be uh, hosting conversation tables. I'm unsure if we will be able to do them um, for this semester, but certainly for next semester. So if you are interested in joining, I really do encourage you to fill out that Google form in the link below. Um, and I hope to see a lot of you coming in so that this is, like I said, a new society that we want to build up and hopefully perpetuate. And it'll be a thing that in 20 years will still be going strong and still be promoting scholarship and um, Middle East outreach. So thank you very much. And um, pass it on to Dr. Zaffer, who will be talking about uh, the dish that we will be cooking. Okay, so this is um, one of my favorite parts, basically, to talk about food. I'm a big um, food enthusiast, and I love cooking. You can ask my wife. She will swear uh, by the dishes, the many dishes that I prepare on a regular basis. And I wanted to give you just some background, an historical background, uh, an introduction about Middle Eastern cuisine in general, um, and also about the dish that we uh, are going to uh, prepare today. Uh, what you see in front of you is basically one or two of the oldest manuscripts that have been ever written about cooking, and they come from the Middle East. The first one has been translated into English and is published. It's called The Annals of the Caliphs' Kitchens, and it's uh, basically an introduction by Ibn Sayyar, the writer who comes from Baghdad in Iraq, uh, and it was written in 940 CE during the Abbasid uh, dynasty in Baghdad. It contains more than 600 recipes, and it contains 132 chapters. These chapters are related to food, uh, characteristics of food and medical nutritional values, benefits, food etiquettes, recipes, and even chapters that contain recipes for fasting Christians uh, during the time of the Abbasid dynasty. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, if you can get your hands on it, you will read uh, many different things and you will learn about the culture and about the food and about the ingredients and the things that were used uh, during the time of the Abbasid dynasty. Another book also is called at tabikh and this book was written by Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Baghdadi uh, in 1226. Hi, Dr. Zephyr, are you there? Hi, Dr. Zephyr, here you go. Can you hear me? Now yeah, we, no, we can. 
So the only difference between the two textbooks, the two manuscripts, is that the one on the right side is mainly interested in the high class, the society of the caliphs and the people that surround them and what they used to eat, versus the one on the left side uh, is basically a middle class textbook that provides recipes of the middle class uh, uh, during that um, time period. Uh, a few observations based on uh, the two textbooks. Uh, is that basically the one on the left, uh, which is the one that targets the middle class, uh, based on my reading, I've noticed that it addresses masculine singular. So it basically targets men, uh, which is really interesting to think about how gender roles used to pan out during that time. Uh, it's not women that used to cook, it's men that used to prepare the meals. Um, the main uh, uh, meats that were used were lamb, chicken, and fish, no beef, even though nowadays people in the Middle East use beef, it would be interesting to see when did beef become uh, a staple basically in the Middle East, but not back then. Uh, the dish was named uh, based on the ingredients. And if there's one thing that changed in that ingredient, a, a, a new name was given to that dish. So let's say for the sake of um, argument that you had uh, rice, uh, chicken and um, vegetables. If you, if you change one kind of vegetable, it will be given a new name. It's not going to be a variation of that dish. Sweet, sour, and salty are the main um, dishes, no spicy uh, dishes were found in the book. Uh, it contains grandfather recipes to many current dishes in the Middle East, including the dish that you will see today. And the used cooking fats were lamb fat, sesame oil, and olive oil, no butter whatsoever, which basically explains why people in the Middle East nowadays do not use butter that much in their cooking. So these are some of the facts uh, that you will see if you've ever had a chance to take a look at the book and the recipe. So today's recipe is called Fettet Jaj. Fette in Arabic means to shred something. And in this case, we're talking about bread and the meat because it's shredded into small pieces. Jaj or Dajaj means chicken. The dish originated in the southwest part of the Levant, which is currently Damascus, Beirut, Jordan, and Palestine, and also in Egypt. Uh, the dish has many regional variations as well, but the shared features are the bread and the meat. It spread gradually to Iraq and the Arabian Gulf and Turkey during the times of the Ottoman Empire. And it could be dated back to the times of the pharaohs when they used to make it after slaughtering an animal during any religious holiday. So it's a really ancient dish. And you can see from the picture here that it's garnished with pomegranate seeds, parsley, and some other nuts as well. This is all that I have to say about this dish. And now um, let's see Chef Jesse, who's going to talk to us and walk us through the preparation steps of this dish. Thank you, Dr. Zephyr. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Globe Kitchen. Sorry to cut you off there, Young. Uh, <laughs> we're just going to get right into the chicken fate. Um, yeah, this is a really simple dish to put together. It, you know, you can easily utilize some leftovers or some random stuff you might have in your fridge. Um, there's basically three components to this dish. Uh, we've got uh, the sauce component, which today we're gonna use some extra virgin olive oil, some garlic, and some plain yogurt. Um, I've got whole milk plain yogurt here, uh, but you could also use a low fat yogurt if you wanted to. And some recipes include some tahini in this and maybe some lemon juice, um, but I, I'm just going simple today. Uh, and so we're gonna keep it with just these uh, basic ingredients. And then we've got uh, over here are kind of like our base ingredients. And uh, we've got some pizza bread and this is a uh, pocket pita bread. It's not the Greek pita, which doesn't have that pocket. You definitely wanna get the Arabic style pita bread. And then I've got shredded chicken here. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can go with the chicken. If you wanna just use chicken breast, you can get chicken breast and you boil it in some water and you can add some different aromatic like spices and things to it, some cinnamon and some um, you know, black pepper and maybe a little um, clove or something like that. And you boil it until it's tender enough that you can shred it apart. 
Uh, one of uh, the recipes that I was looking at uh, recommended, you know, just using like any kind of leftover chicken. And so, and they said, you know, what's even easier is just getting a rotisserie chicken and kind of shredding it all apart. And so uh, that's what I did here. And it, it actually turns out pretty good. You want to get a neutral flavor, just a plain flavored rotisserie chicken, not like lemon pepper or anything like that. Uh, although, I mean, that, would, that wouldn't taste bad. Um, but, and then the third uh, part of the base is chickpeas here. So uh, these are just canned chickpeas and um, we're gonna warm them up. So I've added a little water to the pot here. We're just gonna pop it on the stove. And so these are our base ingredients. As you know, there are a lot of variations to this. Uh, one thing that is across all variations is the pita bread. You can use like, you know, kind of stale pita bread. It doesn't have to be fresh. So this is kind of a dish that would utilize you know, kind of the random things that are in your fridge or, you know, common things that you have around that you can, you know, use up rather than, you know, wasting it. Um, so, and then we've got kind of like the toppings or the garnish. And so here we've got parsley, this is some nice, fresh flat leaf parsley. And then I've also got some pine nuts that I toasted in a pan. But I also saw uh, some recipes had uh, slivered almonds, um, and different nuts in it. And then uh, also, yeah, like pomegranate seeds and uh, that type of, uh, you know, garnish. So we're gonna add some spices also to the chicken to kind of give it some more flavor. And we're gonna do a little paprika, a little coriander, and then some garlic powder too. All right, so first thing you wanna do is get your bread toasted up. And uh, I also saw a couple different recipes for this, or at least techniques. Uh, you can fry it or you can bake it. You basically just want it to get crispy, kind of like uh, tortilla chips or crisps. And so you're gonna open up the pocket here because uh, we want thin, thin pieces of the bread. So it's nice and thin and crispy. So I'm gonna open up these pockets. And all right, now I'm just gonna kind of cut around the edge. So I get two thin slices. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're just trying to get nice thin pieces. The edges are a little bit thicker, that's okay. So everything for this recipe I got at Publix, but uh, this pita is actually in the uh, deli section, but we do have a nice uh, store, Apno Bazaar here that does have fair amount of Middle Eastern products. And I'm sure you could pick up some uh, more traditional pita from, from Apna if you wanted to. Okay. All right, and also for vegetarians, uh, there was just plain chickpea versions and also uh, eggplant versions of this as well. That looked pretty tasty. I personally love eggplant, but I'd like to try that. All right, so this is, we're just gonna slice it into kind of like little cubes, little squares. Doesn't have to be perfect, about an inch. Okay. And we're doing one piece of pita per person. And so the recipe that we have posted online, we, we post all of our stuff on Facebook if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, the recipe that I wrote for this is for four people. So my demonstration today, I'm just doing it for two. And so it's two pitas. And I'm not measuring the olive oil here. I'm just adding some olive oil. And then we're going to toss it. We want to get a nice coating of olive oil in here. We don't need to drench it, but a good amount of olive oil is definitely going to give it some nice flavor and it's going to get nice and crispy too. So a little bit of olive oil and also a little bit of salt. Mix that up. So basically we're making pita croutons here. Same way you would use stale bread to make croutons for a Caesar salad or you know a different kind of salad that croutons are good on. All right, so we're just gonna spread this around on a sheet pan. We're gonna pop it in an oven, 350 degrees. These are quick though, so you wanna keep an eye on them. I mean, maybe five minutes, you know? Keep an eye, check it at five minutes. Um, stir it around a little bit. Sometimes it'll get more dark on another area. 
and you need to kind of mix it up on the pan a little bit so it cooks evenly. Basically, you just want it to be nice and crispy and hard, and we're ready to go. All right, so uh, the next step is to start the sauce. And I, yeah, there was a lot of variations on this sauce too. It seems like everybody has their own kind of take on this, or it might be like whatever is in your fridge and you pop it together, like and you just kind of go with it. Uh, but this one, we're gonna heat the sauce up. Whenever you heat up yogurt, you need to be careful that it doesn't boil because it will separate somewhat into kind of watery stuff and uh, the protein coagulates a bit. So we're gonna gently warm this up. Uh, so it's going to be kind of like a sauce topping at the end here. So the garlic, just gonna quickly take some of these little green parts out. And this is just my personal habit, I always do this. Okay, just gonna give it a nice chop here, rinse it up. I always prefer fresh garlic from the clove. A lot of people think it's a nuisance to have to peel it and chop it up, but the flavor is unmatched. So I always recommend using fresh ingredients. Okay. So here's our garlic. And we're gonna take this over to the stove. We're gonna do it in this saute pan right here. So y'all can see it pretty easily, but you know, any kind of small saucepan would work. We're gonna put a couple tablespoons of olive oil in. And we are going to gently saute our garlic. We're not trying to cook this a whole a whole lot it doesn't really have to turn brown or you know change color or anything we just want it to start releasing kind of its aromatic qualities and so there's that kind of magic moment when you're when you're cooking garlic like this and all of a sudden you'll just get a big you know whiff of some delicious you know garlic and oil together and it's like really like i don't know it gets my stomach going like it always makes me so hungry i'm like oh man i'm ready to eat so just starting to go here and we're going to gently cook it over medium medium low heat okay and then at the same time we're going to start heating this pan up and we're going to cook our chicken in this pan we're going to heat it up so we're also going to do some olive oil And we're gonna let this warm up, then we're gonna add some spices to it. So we're gonna come back to the sauce. So the garlic's going, and we've got our yogurt. And so this is about two cups of yogurt. And this was uh, four cloves of garlic. So them, I like a garlic flavor. If you like a more garlic flavor, you can add more than the recipe. If you like less garlic flavor, you can add less. But I think it's definitely going to be beneficial to have some good amount of garlic in here. All right. All right, so I'm gonna make sure this is very low because we do not want to boil this. We're basically gonna warm it up and the yogurt will thin out and it'll become more of like a sauce consistency. We're just gonna let it hang out for a little bit here while we cook our chicken. And uh, we'll taste it after a minute and see if uh, how much salt it's gonna need because we're definitely gonna add some salt to that. All right, so. For our chicken pan, let's see, let's turn that off. We're gonna add some spices. I'm just gonna put in some coriander, about a half teaspoon or so, a little paprika, and then a little bit of garlic powder, not much. If you have thyme, you could also put thyme in there. And uh, you know, there's many different spices that could go into this. Kind of depending on the variation, to depending on your taste. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of YouTube videos and tons of recipes for this for all the regions. All right, so we're going to toast the spices a little bit in the oil. And then we're going to add our shredded chicken. 
If you do go out and get a rotisserie chicken, uh, the best thing to do to handle this is to uh, take the skin off and debone the meat uh, while it's warm. At, like, you know, preferably right after you bought it. So you take it home, you can skin it, debone it. If you chill it whole, it's really, you have to warm it back up to get the meat off the bone. And it can kind of, it's harder. Once you cool something and reheat it, you want to eat it. So if you want to save this, or if you get a whole chicken, you know, you're going to have many cups. This is only half a chicken right here. So um, when you get it, you prepare it and get the, get the meat all ready. And then you can pack it up in, in the Ziploc and freeze it into portions. You just pull it out when you need it. It's just more convenient and more like food safety for your own for your own health to handle it that way. Okay. So right now the, the goal here is we're just heating up the chicken. We wanted to cook those spices a little bit. It's, it's already cooked. So we're really just trying to get it nice and hot and get it flavorful. So we're gonna add a little bit of salt to that as well. And you can go ahead and taste it and make sure it's salted and spiced enough to your liking. It's really kind of up to you how, how spicy it's gonna be. Right. And then also we're gonna need to get these garbanzos on the stove. Uh, I don't have a microwave in here, but you could easily just microwave the garbanzos for 30 seconds and they just warmed up. It's just, you need to warm up all these components. All right, I'm gonna turn up the sauce a little bit. Oh yeah, see how that's gotten even more liquidy? Yeah, that looks great. So if you were going to add your other components like the tahini and lemon juice, you could add that at this point and just kind of whisk it in. And we're gonna add some salt to that yogurt. I'd say probably at least the teaspoon to the two cups, maybe a little bit less. All right, you see the edge where it started to boil? You see how that separates where it gets a little bit watery and then it gets the protein coagulates. If the whole thing boils, it'll just be kind of a mess. So be very careful about how you warm up your yogurt. All right, so the chicken's kind of warm. Oh, that's hot. All right, our garbanzos are warming up here. And let's go back and assemble our bowls. So kind of nice big soup bowls work well for this dish. Um, from what I was reading, I think this is popular for breakfast. Uh, but it, I, obviously it could be enjoyed for any meal of the day, but um, seems like this is a popular breakfast item from what I can tell. Actually, hold on. I got one more thing to do. I'm jumping the gun here. Uh, we got to prepare our parsley. And um, so whenever you're handling fresh herbs, you know, you want to uh, wash them pretty well, cold water. And then you also need to uh, get them pretty dry before you want to cut them up. So paper towel, gently kind of blot them and you can wrap them in a paper towel and just let them sit and the moisture will soak into the paper towel pretty quickly. And uh, you want nice crisp leaves, any kind of herbs, you know, any any wilting, you're not going to want to use those. And we're just going to pick the, the leaves off this parsley. Uh, cilantro is good to use the stem. And you know you could use a little bit of stem on this parsley, maybe the little branches here. But definitely, once you get down to this, it's going to be really stringy and woody, and it's kind of like like even tougher than uh, celery. So uh, you definitely want to just grab these leaves and pinch them off, and we're going to gather them. into a little pile. And so herbs are really delicate. Um, and so we need to handle them with care. So uh, after you get them washed and picked, I like to kind of ball them up and stuff them into my hand gently. So I'm not crushing them or bruising them. I'm just getting them together 
into a compact shape so that I can easily uh, cut them fine. If you just have it loose on the board, you're gonna be chopping it up and it's gonna bruise them a lot. You're not gonna get nice slices on it. And um, so this, this really works well to, to compact it up. And so then we can come and gently slice it. We're getting nice, nice cuts on this. It's not bruised, it's not mashed. It's gonna be nice and fluffy and light. It'll look really nice as a garnish as well as tasting very nice too. So you see, just gently move your fingers back as you slice. And keep your herbs all together. And you're using a slicing motion. You don't wanna go like this with herbs. You're not really gonna cut it too much more. It's just gonna bruise it all up. You gotta use that slicing motion so you can kind of gather it back up. You can go over it again if you really want to get a good mince. Okay. And there we go. All right. Bonzos are warm. And now we are ready to build our bowls. All right, so we're going to put half the cheetahs in one, half the cheetahs in the other. So this is this version that we're doing here is kind of like it's it's a fresh version. So uh, we're building it in the bowl and serving it immediately. You don't want to build this ahead of time and then serve it an hour later. Uh, you want your pita crisp to stay nice and crisp. You get a really nice textural contrast. Um, but there are some other dishes that I saw that uh, layer all of these ingredients and then they bake it together in a, in like casserole style, which actually looked really good to me too. All right, so. The garbanzos, we're going to strain this water out. We're going to put some garbanzos in each one. Okay. And then we've got our shredded spiced chicken. Put a good, good amount of that in each one. There we go. And then we're going to get our sauce. We're going to pour our sauce over. All right, I'm just stirring in this olive oil here. All right. Here goes the yogurt sauce. All right, that looks like enough. Maybe a little more in this one. Okay, and then from here we'll do a little garnishing. And so we've got the pine nuts. We do a couple little spots here. You can just kind of sprinkle it over. I'm gonna do a little kind of a parsley stripe. Some of the pictures of these online are really nice. They people really put this together really well. So give you a lot of color contrast and texture contrast. I'm gonna do the, and yeah, the pomegranate seeds in particular are just beautiful. Now, I think it's actually pomegranate season's coming up here pretty soon in the States anyways. A little parsley, or sorry, some paprika. Whoops, it's a little heavy. And then I'm gonna do a little swizzle of olive oil on top there. All right, well, this is chicken fate. Uh, really easy dish to put together. Um, hope you all enjoyed the demo and give it a shot at home. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and uh, I will see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, Chef Jesse. Um, it did, does look so good. <laughs> Thank you, Lara, for zooming in here. <laughs> it looks so good. All right. Um...